Hello everyone, how are we doing? It's always very exciting to be asked to come and speak on that sort of sleepy just after lunch uh, slot where everyone's sort of digesting and feeling a little bit low on energy. But, you know, thank you for inviting me. It's fantastic to be here. Um, I should say, by the way, I will give the impression of having some kind of agenda or stuff to talk about, but don't let the, the stage and the lecture fool me or fool you. If there's any point where you'd like a question and you want to ask something, don't feel you have to wait to the end. You know, you're not going to disrupt me from my flow just to just sort of call out. Anyway, so what are we going to talk about? Well, when I do these presentations, I always have to get my presentation cleared by cons people. And when they look through my presentation, one of the things that, you know, they correct my spelling mistakes, they tell me my stuff doesn't make sense. But they say to me, Alex, the most important thing is that the very first slide you show after your introduction to the audience, the very first slide has got to be this one. So I'll let you, um, I'll let you inwardly digest that. They absolutely insisted that that get put up. I'm not entirely sure why, because... I haven't read it, and I, I don't think you'll read it either. But what I did do is I made a word cloud. And I thought what we could do is we could look at the word cloud and try and figure some of this stuff out together. Um, yeah, so it's talking about shell, something about statements, presentation, looking. I think the gist of it is, I'm going to say a whole bunch of stuff. Typically, I'm not talking about the stuff I'm doing right this second or right this month or even recently. I'm usually talking about stuff that is a little bit old. Um, nothing that I sh say should be considered investment advice. I mean, obviously, Shell's a fantastic company, great products and all that, but I'm not talking on behalf of the company. And to be honest, even the stuff I say on analytics and R, you should probably take with a pinch of salt as well. Okay, cool. So, what do we are? I work for Shell Lubricant. Shell is a very big company. And just a little bit of brand awareness straight off the bat and to check we're all awake. Show of hands, who's heard of Shell? Yes. Who's heard of me? No one. So, let's work on that second one. <laughs> Right. So um, you could probably read faster than I can talk. It's a complicated network. We're 50 um, lubricant brain lending plants, 18 grease manufacturing plants. We make a huge range of products that go into pretty much everything. So if it moves, turns, has an engine, travels, flies, drives, etc., etc., we make the absolutely the best lubricant to go in that particular vehicle. Um, our salespeople. Um, have explained to me how fantastic our products are across the range. They're very, very interesting technical products that do a lot of amazing things. Um, I do occasionally visit, visit plants and see how they're built, but my role is typically to solve business problems that are primarily numerical in nature. If they don't involve numbers, I mean, do ask me, I'll give it a go, but it's usually better if it involves some kind of numbers. Anyway, a bit more on our, on our network. So this is the sort of environment that you have. You've got a base on manufacturing plant, you've got a whole bunch of technical components, these get blended together, that's when the magic happens, and it becomes a finished product in a whole bunch of very recognisable, very well-known brands, things like Helix, Advance, Gaddis, all these brands, and used in lots and lots of applications. So very heavy usage. Now, our products are, generally speaking, expensive to make, expensive to move, expensive to dispose of, and expensive to store. So moving all this stuff around is quite pricey. Making it's quite pricey, keeping it's quite pricey, disposing of it, you don't want to do that. We want to sell it. And this is kind of where I come in. Now, one of the things that I say often to my team and to the guys and to the, the business is I'm not Microsoft. So customers don't pay me to make PowerPoint presentations. They also actually don't pay me to do clever analyses. What they do pay me for is that product out the door that they can buy. So I try to keep that kind of business focus in everything that I do. Now, what I thought I'd talk about is, I imagine there's lots of people today talking about really kind of cutting edge stuff that they're doing in R. Um, I'm very aware that none of the stuff I'm going to show you is pushing the boat out with what you can do with R. It's more a fun story about how we started using R for all the wrong reasons and to do all the wrong things and how much fun we had using it very, very badly. Um, today, I hope we use it a lot better, but this is first step, so give me a bit of sympathy. And by the way, the, the usual rule applies, so if you have questions, comments, suggestions, any of that, just you won't bother me. It's all good. Right, okay. So why did I start using R in the first place? So one of the problems that I had was that our forecasting process was very, very bad. We had a process that was well documented, it was collaborative, it spoke to all the right people, and what was more, most important about the process is it was wrong. It eroded value at every step of the forecasting process. 
And so what I did is I built a tool um, in Access in Excel, it was a little while ago, that improved this process. It gave people information, it helped people stop doing all the damaging car on ice steering that they do that trashed their forecast. And it was built in um, Access in Excel. And what I wanted to do, and by the way, this, this tool was called Delphi. As far as I know, every single company in the world, everywhere, has a forecasting tool called Delphi. It's like it's a rule or something. You build a forecasting tool, you call it Delphi. So yeah, so forecasting tool is called Delphi. I have no proprietary ownership of the name. So what we did, we tried to build it in Spotfire. Now, Spotfire is a fantastic application. I love Spotfire a lot. I also hate Spotfire a lot, so it's, it's a good, good relationship I have with um, the Spotfire application. It is fab. And what I want to do is load into it, you know, 50 or so Excel files. And 50 or so Excel files can load into Spotfire, but if you're constantly changing the names of them or moving them around or stuff like that, you couldn't really point Spotfire at a folder and say, empty that folder, stitch all the files together and, and just do that for me. It's a very kind of simple problem. This is a bit where I feel very sad when someone tells me, actually, you can do that in Spotfire and you didn't need to go into R. And I'll be <laughs> quite sad, but what might. So my initial problem was, well, how do I load all these files? So what I did is I decided, right, um, I'm going to download R and I'm going to use it to stitch a whole bunch of files together and then load that into Spotfire as a single CSV. And I'm very well aware there are probably a million other ways to do that particular problem. Um, I guess there's a little bit of context to that. Working for a large organisation, which I'm sure some of you do, IT is usually pretty locked down and getting software and getting access to other stuff is quite difficult. Um, my real coup was having a computer, program, a computer that was unlocked so I could just download and install software, software, particularly if I didn't have to pay for it. So that's when R kind of stepped in and was just fantastic. It was like, it's free, I can download it, I can use it, and it solved an initial problem. And I think, I'm assuming that everyone who um, uses R in the audience probably appreciates that's a pretty rubbish use of R to begin with, right? Has anyone else downloaded and decided to use R just for the purposes of stitching some files together and solving an immediate problem? Yes, one! Fantastic, we got one person. Good, I'm not alone. I am not alone. Which is, which is pretty reassuring, actually. So what I had then is a situation where... I have this application, I built it in Spotfire, I said Spotfire is fantastic, but what I did is I had R at the back end doing the dragging all the files in and then pushing it to Spotfire. And what that let me do is actually push a lot of my calculations that I would normally do in Spotfire into a kind of back end of R. So if it can be pre-calculated, I'd do it in R. And usually it's pretty simple stuff for me, adding, formula, adding columns together, a little bit of data data change, um, renaming stuff, nothing too heavy. And then on the front end, I'm really just using Spotfire as a visualizer. Every now and again, I'd come across a calculation that was a little bit complicated or couldn't be done natively um, in Spotfire. And with help from our friends in Tibco, we managed to you know, use Tear to get these calculations to run. So we used R in two places, in the back end and also in the front end for a few calculations that we had to use. And that, in a nutshell, was our beginning with R. Now, hopefully, since that point, we've started using it for a lot more interesting and um, useful things. However, that was how we started. And that was how R landed and expanded, at least within the Shell LSE analytics team. There is used in other analytics teams within the organization quite a lot. So one of the problems I want to talk about is something that we, we tried to do something, I guess it was a bit like Amazon, and we called it customer market basket. So we sell, we sell products to our customers. And what we wanted to do was find really good suggestions for giving customers an upsell and also giving customers a cross-sell. Now, that had lots of complications with our products that I'll talk about briefly before I move on. <coughs> so, like many com companies, we have particular brands, and we point those brands at the marketplace in different ways in different tiers. So, for some of our products, that's very, very um, differentiated, particularly if it's facing sort of end end consumers will have, for example, entry-level products. You can upgrade then to mainstream-level products, and you can go from mainstream to premium products. Now, typically, as you go from an entry-level product to a premium product, it gets more expensive for, for you as a customer. It also, it also typically has more specialist applications, so you might be able to use it in extreme environments. It might last longer, um, etc. And usually during that transition from entry to premium products, we're actually talking about an increase in margin for the company, so we want to sell premium products. 
Now, why would a customer ever buy a premium product? Because I've just told you it's more expensive, right? Customers are cunning that way. Typically, when we're trying to do an upsell, we usually make an argument along the lines of, well, it reduces your total cost of ownership somehow, as in the cost that you have in changing the oil or the frequency or the times you have to replace your engine. Usually, there's some reduction in total cost of ownership. It could be for environmental reasons. Higher grade of lubricants might make the engine burn more cleanly or have other environmental benefits. Um, that customers are willing to pay for. Uh, and likewise, it might be regulation. It might just be that the regula regulatory environment has changed and therefore a more premium product is actually what you need to do. Now, what we discovered is, remember, I'm, coming, um, I'm sort of coming at this problem as a business person with some familiarity with their products, but not as a salesperson doing day-to-day -day sales and, or with technical familiarity with each and every single one of our products. But let me talk you through a little bit of the journey and some of the, the background to the problem. One of the other things, um, in addition to the upsell, of course, was trying to do a cross-sell. So the idea, well, if you bought this, you would also like this. And I guess the classic example of that, I put there for my sort of Amazon page, and you'll see there's a whole bunch of books on JavaScript. You might imagine that's not particular, that's tailored to me. You don't, as a default customer, get that. So Amazon knows I'm quite sad and suggests all these books for me, um, and I tend to buy them. One of the problems that we have, well, not a problem, but one of the sort of factors of lubricant products is that the use is not discretionary. So if you go into Amazon or if you go into a supermarket and it happens to position you know, shampoo and conditioner together, for example, you can choose to use conditioner or choose not to use conditioner. You can make that choice and therefore consume more or less of the product that you're buying. Now, if you're driving a car, you're going to put lubricant in it and you're going to use grease on the axles and stuff like that. That's non-discretionary. If you're driving that car, you're using that product. Therefore, when we make a recommendation outside, um, outside the sort of use set that the machine you're operating has, you can't consume it. I can recommend the best product in the world to you for a tractor, but if you don't own a tractor, you're not going to buy it. So this is where some of the, the cross-sell complexity comes. So what, we're, what we generally observe, if we're seeing a breakdown in the cross-sell logic, what's happening is that you, you're driving a car, so you need that product, therefore if you're not buying it from us, you're buying it from a competitor, and therefore we want to find out why the customer is doing that. Um, and do I talk about some of the complexities? Let's talk about it. This gets more complicated, and I'll come to that later on. So let's talk about upsell. Sorry, is everyone with me so far? Is this something we can all relate to? People are nodding, people are awake, eyes are open, we are going somewhere. Good. So let's talk about the upsell. One of the things I discovered about our kind of product catalogue, if you will, is that it was a little bit disorganised, to say the least. Now, if you're a human being rec or a salesperson, recommending an upgrade is actually a fairly simple activity because you know the product very well. One of the nice features, of course, for our sales teams is that they have really good technical knowledge of our products and therefore any recommendation for an upsell that they make to a customer will be a sensible one and be based on the relationship with that customer. How do I do that if I'm a computer? And I kind of try to illustrate that problem, and, and this is an example actually I, I farmed out to one of our teams as a problem using the kind of light bulb example. And the reason I use a light bulb example is my kind of first experience of this um, as, a, as a consumer came as a sort of cross-sell um, or product replacement issue when I was doing home shopping some five, ten years ago. I ordered a 100-watt bayonet cap light bulb from a retail company. They didn't have that, and their computer suggested that, oh, well, what Alex would really like is a 100-watt screw cap light bulb. And so when I got this, I'm like, thanks. <laughs> you can take that one back. Um, and, and you can see the problem. So it's a substitution, a 100-watt bulb for a 100-watt bulb. Good so far, but because I wanted a bayonet cap and it gave me a screw cap, it's completely useless. Now, I don't think what we're thinking here is a real risk with suggesting all sorts of garbage to our customers because the salesperson acts as a very good filter for that when they see these suggestions. But more the idea was that we quickly lose the confidence of our internal business customers if they happen to see these suggestions. So if they sit down in front of a in front of a tool expecting to see you know, a suggested upgrade and it's the bayonet to screw cap equivalent, they're going to lose confidence in the tool, they're going to lose confidence in what we've done, and we lose adoption early on. Because often my most immediate customer is the internal one who I'm trying to convince to use whatever it is I build. 
I mean, as I said, I'm not Microsoft, so the analysis itself, I don't get paid for. I only get paid if I can shift, well, I get paid anyway, but you get what I say. The analysis is only worth it if I ship product, and if no one is using my tools, I effectively serve no function. Okay, so this was a problem. So what you would expect is some kind of structure that supported that in our product catalogue. So we do have a product catalogue, and it's organised in a broadly logical way, so that we have, for example, we have a molecule that has a particular set of functionalities, and then it has a product name, and then it fits into various pack sizes. So you've got drums, small pack, um, pails, etc. But what we didn't have is this kind of application that I'm showing here of bayonet cap to screw cap. So that was a problem. And it was a problem that we solved with R. And what we, what we did is we actually used... Well, actually, originally... Sorry, it's a, a slight digression. Um, I found this out to some colleagues to solve. I said, look, what we're going to have to do, because I can't think of anything else to do in the meantime, is look at the product description and pull out the viscosity variant. So the 10W40 there tells you how the lubricant performs in different temperatures, and that's important. And it's important that that should match in the upgrade. Now, for non-automotive, it, it's different, but the principle is there. There's a particular bit of the product description that contains this information. And I sent out requesting an answer, so I went on holiday and came back two weeks later to find that I was handed an Excel document using substring or mid or whatever the Excel functions are to pull that out. And I was like, no, that's not what I'm wanting. I'm actually looking for some, a function that I can embed in the rest of the R application. So there we are. So that's what we did. So we, we effectively did string matching, pulling out the viscosity variant, and then looking at the rest of the description to try and suggest what is a plausible upgrade. Because that, for example, the HX5 would be tagged as a mainstream product, the HX7 would be tagged as a premium product, so I know that's an upgrade. It gets more complicated at the upper end, because we do have Helix Ultra, which is even more premium, um, that I have to identify by looking at like the margin we make. But remember, data is noisy. Okay. Um, cross-sell. What we did in cross-sell is fairly standard association rules. So we're looking at products that happen to sell together. So if a cross-sell, again, you know, you go on Amazon, you buy five albums of one type, it'll recommend the tenth album. So it's fairly simple. With our products, I felt it was a bit more complicated because the use wasn't discretionary. And also, we tend to operate a lot of our business through resellers. And this means that you're actually you're not selling to an end customer who owns machines that use these products. You're actually selling to a reseller who buys a whole for a whole bunch of complex reasons, and the associations can get quite strange. Um, and also, so a lot of the information was quite bucketed. So initially, we wanted to do this as quite a for large. Um, IT supported rollout where we could pull straight from our database systems but in again if you're in a large company you'll empathize with this that work was delayed so we're using things like comma separated volumes and downloads and smashing data together um, so it was fairly it was actually fairly tricky but again we we had a go uh, using association rules and we tried to we tried to sort of make logical suggestions by doing a bit of filtering within it so the idea was if we had a grease product and often a recommendation from that is, well, you sold one type of grease, why don't you sell another type of grease? We thought, well, for the salespeople involved, that might be a bit of a, yeah, thanks. So we tried to offer different types of brands. And there's a few complexities in there. Okay, so this is a bit of a demo of um, <clears throat> what we sort of put together using that. So again, you remember, I followed my sort of structure that I outlined with an R back end. It pushes in to an R front end. And this was a prototype that we put in front of our business users. The idea was that we'd have kind of, there was a lot of discussion on this as to what the correct output from this type of project should be. A few people would advocate that what we should do is just give the salespeople a list, possibly in Excel, of recommendations, pursue these leads. What we tried to do was do something that did a bit of both, so perhaps give an overview to people who might be planning a marketing campaign with the capability to download, and you can see there that it's visualized in Spotfire. Because we had a few um, connections with sort of business sponsors, I got the chance to try out a few different ideas. So one thing, for example, um, just to mention a few of the things that didn't work, I've got plenty of things I try that don't work. We tried um, clustering our customers, and what I did is I did a whole bunch of customer clustering um, to then get them grouped into categories based on what they would like to buy. And I decided to take the interesting move of naming all those customer groups after random bird names. So I eliminated things like Vulture and Dodo, but I used bird names. And that was surprisingly unpopular. No one liked bird names, but there we are. Um, so this is a visualisation in Spotfire. What you can see is that we have 
Um, the idea that you can drill down in spot fire. This went for a prototype in the US. I passed it on to a different team. It's still in prototype phase being explored there. And because it passed to a different team, we sort of, I think the feedback that they got and a lot of what they wanted was they wanted simpler. Most of the time, I tell people that the most difficult and complicated thing I do is try to make things seem simple. And even with what I felt was a fairly simple application, we're still getting the request to make it simpler, make it like a table, follow ratios to make it more understandable. So, what I mentioned is I do tend to talk, and again, plenty of time for questions, I do tend to talk about stuff that I've done a few years ago or a little bit, a little bit ago. So I just wanted, unless there's any pressing questions at this exact moment, um, talk a little bit about what we've been doing recently. <clears throat> Some of the stuff that we're doing is things like pattern recognition and time series. So thankfully we've moved a little bit beyond stitching Excel files together and trying to look for human mistakes. So we have, for example, stock levels in a warehouse. We track that over time. And we have particular thresholds for stock. So we have this idea of safety stock, a stock level which we, we hold simply to buffer the vagaries of demand and the vagaries of supply. And a very human behaviour that you might understand is someone planning that will see, for example, that if they happen to sell a large amount of product, they'll eat into safety stock, panic, and then make two batches, and then they're into a kind of excess stock, you know, stock above which we would like to hold. And what a person has done there is they've just put £100,000 on the company credit card because we will have that excess stock. It costs a lot of money to make that stock. And so what we're trying to do is use R to help us identify those patterns. And that's quite interesting because rather than being needle in a haystack, we can actually delve in and say, well, actually, this has all happened, link it to an individual and, and get some responsibility and, and support them ultimately in not making those sort of behavioural errors. Another example that we have more recently is things like um, integrated business value planning, which is trying to link together all of our metrics um, into kind of a single dashboard. So people who were typically planning and operating in silos, where if I'm in forecasting, I see a forecast number and a sales number, or I'm in finance, I see the finance number. The idea that we have applications that blend all of that data together. I guess this goes back to kind of that classic use I was saying in the beginning. That would be an IT project. It could be done by IT. But because we're faster, we tend to do it in R and bring the data together in R and show it in a spot for our visualisation. I've often sort of made this joke to my IT colleagues that sometimes the IT function these days isn't the best place to actually hold the IT function. Um, and it's just not keeping pace with the general demands of the business. Cool. So, um, I, sorry, that's been a very whistle-stop tour. 30 minutes is not a, it's not a long time. I appreciate that. Um, no one had any questions that they sort of felt urgently that they needed to ask, but I hope that doesn't mean that no one has any questions. So I'm perfectly happy to answer or, or listen to suggestions or anything like that. Okay, thank you very much.